So uh, let me uh, uh, welcome everybody to, to today's seminar. We have a little bit different uh, format and I want to just uh, talk about that for a moment. So uh, as the speaker is talking, um, you are free to, uh, to put comments in the chat. Uh, those comments will be seen by myself uh, and, and another host uh, and Alan. And then at the end or in the middle, if we see a question that, that we would like to have uh, answered then, then uh, I'll, uh, I'll interrupt and ask uh, Alan that question. And then at the end, Alan will take uh, general questions. But let me uh, say a little bit about uh, uh, Alan Robach, he's a distinguished professor here at Rutgers, and he received his uh, PhD at, in, uh, at, in 1977 from MIT, and his advisor was uh, Ed Lorenz, uh, quite a famous scientist. So prior to joining Rutgers, Alan was uh, a professor at the University of Maryland, among other things, and uh, was the state climatologist for the state of Maryland, uh, and then joined Rutgers, and after joining Rutgers, uh, Alan was named a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, and he's also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In 2015, he received the Jewel Charney uh, Award a Medal from the American Meteorological Society for his work on uh, uh, aerosols in the stratosphere that are a result from, of uh, volcanic activity. And most recently, the Cassandra Award in 2018 and the Chancellor's Award for Global Impacts here at Rutgers in 2020. And this is a short list of awards. There are many others. So uh, without, I guess the best thing to say here is that uh, I'll let Alan uh, speak for himself, but, uh, but um, and, and he's gonna talk today a little bit about some of uh, his work on, on uh, nuclear war, which has been a great passion of his. So um, Alan. Thanks very much, Mark. I want to talk about global famine after nuclear war. And most of this is funded by the Open Philanthropy Project. I want to start by acknowledging that uh, Henry Rutgers, the namesake of Rutgers on slaves, as did the, many of the early presidents, slave labor built the Rutgers campus. The land on which Rutgers sits was taken from the Lenny Lenape natives. And we benefit from the Morrill Act which allowed New Jersey to sell land taken from Western Native Americans for the benefit of Rutgers. If you wanna learn more about that, you can visit the Scarlet and Black Project of Rutgers. I wanna start uh, by talking about Sherry Rowland who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on ozone depletion. And this is, was his obituary at EOS. He said, what's the use of having developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end, all we're willing to do is stand around and wait for them to come true. He also said at, at a White House climate change roundtable, is it enough for a scientist simply to publish a paper? Isn't it a responsibility of scientists if you believe you've found something that can affect the environment? Isn't it your responsibility to actually do something about it? So this idea is, is part of what inspires me to work on this topic. So I'm gonna talk about nuclear winter theory. And since it's theory analogs to test the theory, policy implications, and then doing something about it. And one thing I want to encourage you to do is to join the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction. This work was started in the 1980s by a bunch of people who are now pretty old, uh, Rich Turco, Brian Toon, Tom Ackerman, me, and Gira Stenchikov. And this was a picture taken at the last AGU meeting in person. But we've entrained a lot of younger people to work with us now too, Cheryl Harrison and Nikki Lovandusky, who are oceanographers, Lily Shaw at Rutgers, who's working on crop modeling, uh, Julie Lundquist, who works on uh, firestorms, Mike Mills, Chuck Bardeen, Josh Koop, who do climate modeling, and jo Jonas Jagermeyer, who works on crop modeling. So this is a work I'm gonna talk about, which is a collaboration of all these people and, and a number of, of others. And I've been sponsored by a, a lot of different places over time, including NSF, Rutgers, the Defense Nuclear Agency, the Swiss government, and CAR, but, but the Open Philanthropy Project funds us generously now. And we've written many papers about this, some in, in very prestigious journals like Science and Proceedings in National Academy of Sciences and Nature, but uh, a lot of people aren't paying attention to it. So that's why I want to do more about it. And if you want to look at any of these papers, these are just our papers from the last three years, you can go to that website and I'll, I'll put the website at the end again so you can access them. Here's the story. Our beautiful planet, 
might look like this after a nuclear war with smoke from fires that would be ignited by nuclear weapons and burn cities and industrial areas going up into the upper atmosphere and blow around the world and uh, blocking out the sun. And if there's enough smoke, it would make it cold, dry, and dark at the surface. And this would have a huge impact on crops. The heating of the upper atmosphere would also destroy ozone, which would let more ultraviolet radiation through, which would also have a negative effect. Here's some data on the total number of nuclear warheads uh, that have been deployed uh, on Earth. And you can see it was going up until the 1980s and started to go down. Why did this nuclear arms race end? Well, in 1982, Paul Crutzen, who shared the Nobel Prize with Sherry Rowland, and John Burks pointed out that after a nuclear war, there would be a lot of smoke from fires. And after that, a Russian group, Alexander F. and and an American group, Turco, Tun, Ackerman, Pollock, and Sagan, did climate model simulations to calculate how the climate would actually change. And they found it would get cold, so cold that it would be below freezing even in the winter, even in the summer, and they called it nuclear winter. And then I had a paper in Nature and a group at NCAR uh, did some more climate modeling, all substantiating that result. And then the arms race ended. I think we were speaking truth to power, and that was part of the reason. The Soviet Union didn't end until five years later, so that wasn't the cause of the end of the arms race. That uh, that happened much later. And I also want to point out that the number of nuclear weapons deployed is not zero, it's still 10,000. How do I prove or try to demonstrate that, that we, were, we did this? Well, you ask the people that made the decision. Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. He said, a great many reputable scientists, he called us reputable, are telling us that such a war could just end up in no victory for anyone because we would wipe out the earth as we know it. If you think back to natural calamities, back in the last century in the 1800s, volcanoes, we saw the weather so changed there was snow in July in many temperate countries. And they call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the whole nuclear exchange, nuclear winter? And then the other person was Mikhail Gorbachev who was leading the Soviet Union and he said, Models made by Russian and American scientists show that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on Earth. That knowledge was a great stimulus to us. So Russian and American scientists were giving the same message and it was accepted. So that was 40 years ago. Why am I still talking about it? So one question is, could the remaining arsenal still produce nuclear winter? And as you may know, there are now seven more countries that have nuclear weapons. Uh, Britain, France, uh, the UK, I mean, the, uh, Israel, uh, Pakistan, India, China, North Korea. What if there was a war between them? They have many fewer weapons than the US and Russia. US and Russia have about 90%. What would be the consequence of that? Here's the answers. Yes, we can still produce nuclear winter. And it would last for many years. And this would not be nuclear winter. That is the temperature would not go below freezing. But it, the direct effects would be horrific from blast radioactivity and fires. And there would still be so much smoke that it would have huge agricultural impacts. Now, you may not know this, but it was the policy of the US Air Force to bomb cities and burn them in Japan during the summer of 1945. They start, and this is a map from the uh, publication of the, the Army Air Forces, and it has the cities that were bombed, and a city that's the equivalent size uh, at the time. So Tokyo was the same size as New York. And on March 10th, 1945, they sent over 300 airplanes to, to burn Tokyo and killed so many people that it burned to death more people in, one, in 24 hours than ever before or since in the history of, of our planet. And after that, Every three days or so, they sent out fleets of airplanes to burn cities. And they killed more than 800,000 uh, Japanese ci citizens, more than twice as many uh, as, as uh, military that died in World War II. And the, the last two cities that they burned were Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They did it because with nuclear weapons, with atomic bombs, which were much more efficient, they only needed one bomb, but it was part of a, a, a campaign. It wasn't something new. So in Hiroshima on August 6th, a 15 kiloton bomb killed about 150,000 people. 
A kiloton is the uh, a thousand equivalent explosive power of a thousand tons of TNT. So this was a so a one percent of a megaton. The bombs we have now are much bigger. So our current world arsenal is so big that if you dropped a Hiroshima bomb every twice every two hours for more than 75 years, starting on August 6, 1945, you still couldn't use up the current arsenal. This is the airplane that did it, the Enola Gay, named after the mother of Paul Tibbetts, the pilot. And this is, I saw this in the Air and Space Museum uh, in a warehouse back when I had hair and it was black. And uh, this is a mock-up of the uranium weapon that was used dropped on Hiroshima. This is the front and the back half of the plane. It's since been restored and it's on display at the, uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Annex out by Dulles Airport in Virginia. So you can see it there if you want. On the left is a picture taken right after the bomb was dropped. This is the mushroom cloud from the weapon. And this picture on the right was taken about three hours after the attack. This isn't the mushroom cloud. This is a pyrochemonimbus cloud, a thunderstorm started by the fires that pumped smoke high up into, into the stratosphere. This is at the tropopause where it starts to level off. Three day, and this is what this, one of the survivors uh, remembers is the fires. This is a drawing done by one of the survivors. Here's another one. And here's another one. And three, this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. Three days later, we dropped a bomb on Nagasaki. It was a plutonium bomb called Fat Man. It was a compression bomb. And this is a picture I took at the, uh, at the museum there of Fat Man and the bomb. And this is the Nagasaki mushroom cloud. And so what Nagasaki looked like afterwards. It doesn't take nuclear weapons to burn cities. There was an earthquake in 1906 in San Francisco that started a fire that lasted for three days. Jack London, the famous author, was commissioned to write an article about it. And he wrote, within an hour after the earthquake shock, the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible 100 miles away. For three days and nights, this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm, not a flicker of wind stirred. Yet from every side, wind was pouring in upon the doomed city. East, west, north, and south, strong winds were blowing upon the doomed city. The heated air rising made an enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. This is a, a classic uh, description of a pyrocumulonimbus cloud where the smoke pushed itself up into the upper atmosphere. Fortunately, we don't have very many examples of this. This is what San Francisco looked like afterwards, only the, some of the stone buildings remain. So let's talk about the current nuclear arsenal. There are about 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. This is a, a poster, it's on the door to my office and it's done by the University of Nagasaki. And they have a, uh, this is all the Russian weapons, this is all the American weapons, and a red is a land-based, five land-based nuclear missiles, a blue is a, a submarine-based missile, a green is one carried by an aircraft, and gray are ones on a shelf waiting to be dismantled. So this is two of them, and the other seven are right here. Let me blow this up so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, China has a, about 350, France 300, UK 200, Pakistan, India 160, Israel 90, North Korea 40. So this brings up one question. How many nuclear weapons do you need? These countries could build as many as they wanted, yet they've stopped at a couple hundred. Why do the US and Russia still have thousands? Uh, if you think you can use them to deter an attack, isn't one enough? So maybe you need two, so a hundred is enough. Why do we still have thousands? Usually if I'm doing in person, I ask a question, but with a webinar, it's kind of hard. So I'll just tell you the answer. Where is this? This orange line is a border between two countries taken from the space station. This is India and Pakistan and Afghanistan. And these lights are big cities, huge cities. So Karachi, 24 million people, Faisalabad, 4 million, 
Hyderabad, almost 4 million. So the question, and these are both nuclear nations, and in between them is Kashmir, where there's been a lot of conflict over the years. So we asked uh, at the, uh, we asked a question, what would happen if they had a nuclear war? At the AGU meeting, 17 years ago, uh, I ran to Rich Turco and, and Brian Toon, and they said, we were calculating how much smoke there would be, and could you calculate the climate response? So imagine uh, a skirmish getting out of hand because of pure communication, misunderstanding, panic, and fear. Uh, or what if, what if our attack on Osama bin Laden was, uh, was misconstrued and started a nuclear war? So we assumed, we did it this in, in 2006, so uh, it was published, what, 14 years ago now. Uh, we, each country had about 100 weapons, so we, and we assumed that they were the size of Hiroshima size, those are the easiest to make. So we asked, what if half of each of the arsenals was used to attack the other country? And it would be much less than 1% of the current war arsenal. The direct effects, 20 million people would die directly, uh, and it, but it would produce about 5 million tons of smoke injected into the upper atmosphere after you account for the amount that would be rained out and how much fuel there would be. We used a state-of-the-art climate model at the time, the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies climate model, four by five degree horizontal resolution, 23 vertical levels, but it went up into the stratosphere and mesosphere. We put 5 million tons of smoke into the upper, upper troposphere and looked at what happened and I made this movie this is where the smoke would go horizontally on the right and this is where it would go vertically this black line is the tropopause so we live down here in the troposphere where there's rain but the smoke would be heated by the sun lofted high up in the stratosphere there's no rain in the stratosphere and it would last for years and so uh, the e-folding lifetime of uh Aerosols from a volcanic eruption, sulfate goes in the lower stratosphere is about a year. Here it was seven years. So after seven years, a third of it would still be there. And then we calculate the climate change. This blue line is the global warming we all know and love and are trying to slow down. But this red line is what would happen for 5 million tons of smoke. It would be instant climate change. And it, it would be so much climate change that it would be unprecedented in recorded human history. The global average temperature would get below the Little Ice Age. And then we wanted to see, well, what would that do to, to agriculture? So every climate model is imperfect, but two other climate models did the same experiment uh, in Switzerland at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and got, got the same result. Global climate change, unprecedented recorded human history from only 100 uh, small nuclear weapons. But it's much worse than that. Uh, this is a Trident submarine. Uh, it can fire 96 nuclear weapons and current American nuclear weapons are 100 or 500 kilotons, not, not, uh, not uh, 15. So each Trident has, is as powerful as 100 Hiroshima's, 1,000 Hiroshima's, not 100 that we did before. We've got 14 of them, and that's half of our arsenal. So the US might have like 25,000 Hiroshima's, not 100. And Russia's got the same, that's 50,000 Hiroshima's. So there was a question, was nuclear winter real? The climate models in the, in the 1980s were very simple ones. We didn't have general circulation models. So we uh, went back and did, redid, redid the calculation. Uh-oh. All right, can you see my share, my screen now? Yes. Okay. So we, we decided to redo nuclear winter. And so we uh, took a, uh, the same climate model and calculated uh, what would happen if there was 150 million tons of smoke, not, not, not just five. And this was a standard scenario 40 years ago, but it turns out, the current arsenal can still produce this much smoke if you target, because we had way too many weapons. We had enough for nine for every target. And that was only a third of the arsenal. So this is a movie now made of the, uh, of the smoke from this scenario. 
And this is a map of how the surface temperature would change a year afterwards in June, July, and August. Huge temperature changes, and even over the ocean. And so let's take a point in the Ukraine and this is a graph showing the daily minimum temperature. So the black line is the daily minimum temperature. In the summer, it gets 20, 25 degrees Celsius, 70 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, for two years. But if you put smoke in on May 15th, the temperatures plummet below freezing and stay below freezing for at least a couple of years. So really, nuclear winter was correct. And this would have a huge devastating effect on agriculture. We've recently redone this simulation with the WACM, the state-of-the-art climate model at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And we were surprised how close the results came. Red is WACM, global average temperature change, and blue is and blue is the GIS model. And this is precipitation. In fact, WACM produced a little bit more climate change, 10 degrees colder for, for like five years, and about half the amount of precipitation. And it turns out in the time since we did our last work, India and Pakistan have been building their arsenals and they may have 400 to 500 weapons altogether by 2025 and they've tested more powerful weapons. So we did a, another simulation. What if they uh, used more weapons and now we think that Pakistan and India could produce 16 to 36 million tons of smoke, not just five. We published this in Science Advances. And so here's a graph with the new WACA model of how much the temperature would change, global average surface temperature, for these different scenarios. The blue is five teragrams of smoke. I showed you that before, about a one degree cooling. The teal up to the uh, orange are what we think India and Pakistan could do now, up to five degrees cooling. The green is the, goal, is the US and Russia case. And so, uh, and it would last for years. If we plot that now on the map of global warming, graph of global warming, like I showed you before, I have to rescale it, of course. I'll just remind you that 20,000 years ago, when ice sheets covered North America at the height of the last ice age, the global average temperature was about five degrees colder than it is now. So this is ice age temperatures. It wouldn't start an ice age because eventually the smoke would fall out and there wouldn't be smoke, this, the ice wouldn't stay around. But for a while, it would be pretty horrible. So let's get to the point. How would this affect agriculture? It would be darker, it would be colder, so plants would grow more slowly. The frost-free growing season would be shorter. Uh, it would take longer for crop maturation. There'd be cold spells during the growing season that could kill crops, and there'd be less rainfall. And additionally, there'd be toxic chemicals in the atmosphere, highly engineered genetic stocks that you couldn't adapt by planting different crops. We wouldn't have fuel for machinery, water, pesticides, distribution system, enhanced ultraviolet. So what we've done so far is we've simulated how crops would change just using these things at the top of the page. Darkness, cold, and less rainfall. We have on our list of things to do is to simulate at the bottom, but we haven't done that yet. So we have a paper that we wrote called Global Famine After Nuclear War that's in, in review now at Nature Food. And so I wanna show you those results. We looked at the different scenarios I just described. This is how the temperature would change uh, over croplands, how the amount of sunlight would change, and how the precipitation would change. They would all be reduced. And over the oceans, we also considered uh, food from fish. So how sea surface temperature would change, how the amount of sunlight reaching the ocean would change, which affects the phytoplankton, plankton, and how the net primary productivity over the ocean would change. We put all these into a crop model, and into a model of how uh, fish grow. And so this is a drawing done 40 years ago uh, when we were talking about nuclear winter, an ocean before and the ocean afterwards. So it would kill the fish and there would be storms along the coastline. So to do these food calculations, we use what's called the community land model, CLM. It has a crop component. It's part of the state-of-the-art uh, CESM2 model at NCAR. It simulates the major, major food crops, maize, rice, soybeans, and wheat. And it simulates grasses, which are used uh, for, for animals. We looked at livestock too. Some of the corn and, and uh, soybeans goes to animals, but they also eat grass. And we used a, a, uh, an ocean model. Uh, and 
for the livestock, we assume that 46% are fed by pasture and 54% are fed by crops and processed products. And we looked at where well, maybe people could take the food that goes to livestock. And that's one adaptation we looked at. And we used FAO data for the calorie content of each food and for all the national import, export, and consumption data. And most of this work was done by Lily, but Lily Shaw, by the way. I'm just a uh, uh, hanger on. And so for crop, we looked at how much the amount of calories you could get from crops would change over the 15 years of our simulation. So for the five teragram, about 10% reduction, but for 37 teragrams, a 40% reduction of food from crops and the fish wouldn't be affected quite as much. If you combine that, but we don't eat that much fish, we get a very small fraction of our total calories from fish. If you combine it together, this is the total, it looks a lot like crop. And if you look at grass, if uh, that would be affected even more than the crop. So this would be a hard for to keep raising livestock. So I learned a lot from this. If you uh, look at the global average diet, about 51% comes from these from crops, about 31% from vegetables, 18% from livestock and fish in terms of calories. If you look at the uh, protein, a lot more comes from livestock, 40%. And if you look at the different crops we simulated, maize, the thick uh, wedge is how much goes for food. The less dark one is how much it goes for feed. And the rest is for other things like, uh, for example, biofuels. Rice, almost all of it goes to food, not much to feed. Soybeans, uh, a lot of it goes to feed. Wheat, most of it goes to food and marine fish. So we put all these together to calculate the total amount of food that was available in every country. And here's, here's our results. So we did two assumptions, two different assumptions. We said, let's assume that uh, all the countries are gonna stop trading food in this disaster. You've seen that already in terms of, for example, the uh, people will hoard, they'll even hoard toilet paper. Uh, in the Arab Spring 10 years ago, countries uh, when Russia stopped exporting wheat when they had a, 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 a fires. And so we're assumed that there's gonna be no food. And if you look at the figure on the left, green means there's enough food to maintain your weight even though the average per capita calorie consumption is 2,900 calories. But uh, if you have more than 2,200 calories, kilocalories, it, okay. If you just stop trading food or trading already, a lot of countries wouldn't have food. And for five teragrams case, uh, we also said, let's, con let's look at year two after the war. So let's assume that all the food uh, is we only have a 40, 60 day supply of food. So let's assume after year two, what would happen? And we, two scenarios, if we continue to raise livestock or if we don't raise livestock, we eat them all and in year one and we just use the food to go to us in these two cases. So for five teragrams, a lot of countries would be okay. A lot of them would not be. But for other scenarios, India, Pakistan, if it's red, it's really bad news. If you have less than 1600 calories, there's not enough to stay alive. And for the nuclear winter case, almost, it's bad for almost everybody. We also looked at what fraction, let, let's assume, this is very unrealistic, but let's assume that after the war that uh, we calculate how much food is gonna be left and we just, don't give any to the people that are gonna die anyway, and we keep it just for the people that are gonna stay alive, what fraction of the people will be alive at the end of year two? And again, uh, even at that, mo that very strange situation, uh, in many places, a red is less than 25% of the people would be alive. Only a few places like Australia, it turns out, uh, wheat is their main, crop and there aren't very many people there and that wouldn't be as as affected as other things and it's a lower latitude so uh, that might be okay but that would be about the only place we also took the global average of calorie intake so the yellow is the livestock case we eat we eat livestock and uh, the hatch line is the portion of calories come from livestock 
The red is, let's say we take the livestock feed and feed it to people. So if we uh, put 20% of it to people, uh, this 20%, 60%, it's not clear that we can convert all the livestock feed for people anyway. So it turns out it doesn't make much difference whether you raise livestock or not. And then we looked at the population that would be alive on the world uh, for uh, these different amounts of smoke and different livestock assumptions. It doesn't make much difference. So with 47 teragrams of soot, uh, half the people of the world will be alive after year two and there will be no food left. 150 teragram, most people would die. We also thought it might be interesting to look at the, these cases for the countries that actually have nuclear weapons for the different scenarios, livestock and no livestock with 50% going to feed humans. That doesn't make much difference. The high latitude countries would be in big, big trouble. China, uh, Russia, United States, North Korea, uh, even the UK, a war between India and Pakistan using less than 1% of the global nuclear weapons on the other side of the world could mean that after uh, two years, most people would die in China, uh, North Korea, Russia, and UK and the US. And for Pakistan, India, we didn't take into account any local damage. We only took into account the availability of them being able to grow food if they could. So much of India and Pakistan would not be able to grow food. So these are very, very optimistic assumptions. But there could be a war between the US and Russia with our current arsenals and everybody would die then. One other thing, this smoke going up in the atmosphere heats, it absorbs sunlight, that's why it gets cold at the surface, and it heats the stratosphere. This is for the India-Pakistan case. This is how much the temperature would go up and that would destroy ozone. And that would mean that more ultraviolet radiation would come to the surface of the Earth. What would, that, what would that mean? A fair-skinned North American would, would have sunburn and increased skin cancer. Crops would be affected. Fisheries would be affected. And we haven't really done this analysis. We're right now putting the UV into the sensitivity, into the crop model, so we can do this calculation. But Chuck Bardeen just published a paper a couple weeks ago with Wacom, with these two cases, India, Pakistan, five teragrams of soot, US, Russia, 150 teragrams how, uh, over years. And it turns out that there'd be so much smoke in the US, Russia case, even though there'd be no ozone, the UV would get absorbed by the smoke and wouldn't get to the surface. And so the UV uh, is the blue line. It wouldn't start to come to the surface till years, out, uh, years later when the smoke goes away. Except for UV, uh, the DNA damage, which is this red line is the UVC, and UVC is a wavelength that is not absorbed very much by the smoke. So even immediately, and this is an index for skin cancer rates. So skin cancer rates would go up. In the India-Pakistan case, there wouldn't be as much smoke. And so this UV effect would start to be felt immediately. You could look at uh, uh, plants, uh, phytoplankton in the ocean, the vitamin D would actually go up. So, but we don't need any more vitamin D. There'd be vitamin D reduction here. Uh, erythema is just your, your skin getting uh, sunburn. Cataracts, black. Uh, so you'd get more cataracts, more uh, DNA damage, uh, uh, and uh, effects on plants. And so this would not be good either. All right, that's the theory. The question is, do you believe me? Well, we don't really want to do the experiment in the real world because <laughs> it would be too late. So we look at different things that we observe and use analogs and test different parts of the theory. I've already mentioned some things. The seasonal cycle gets cold in the winter. It gets cold at night, so we have a good feeling for that. Cities, unfortunately, can burn. I showed you examples of that. What about the smoke and dust transport and surface temperature effects? So on Mars, we observe dust storms covering the planet Mars. It has, it has an atmosphere, an asteroid impact uh, produced smoke and, and particles that killed the dinosaurs. I don't have time to show you all these examples. I'll show you just a couple. Three years ago, there were huge forest fires in Western Canada and the smoke went up into the stratosphere and then was heated by the sun and was lofted high up in the stratosphere. 
And we use the same climate model we've been using for this to do simulate that. And we found uh, that it did a very good job. And what happened was the wildfires injected smoke detectable for more than eight months and it rose within two months. We published this in science. And so here's one figure. It shows the dates after the smoke. We, we modeled it and some of these lines are observations from satellites. It went from 14 or 15 kilometers up to 20 kilometers. And so this smoke got heated and rapidly went up, just like we modeled. A year and a half ago now in Australia, there were forest fires, which much more, three times as much smoke. And again, it was, went to the stratosphere. It, was, it went even higher, went 20 kilometers up and some of it's still up there. Now here's the volcano that Ronald Reagan was talking about, the Tambora volcano, which erupted in 1815 and it produced what was called the year without a summer. I'll just give you a couple examples. This was the, in, in New England, there were huge reductions of temperature in New Haven. And Gillen Wood wrote a book, Tambora, the Eruption That Changed the World. For three years following Tambora's explosion, to be alive almost anywhere in the world meant to be hungry. So this eruption, the effects lasted only a couple of years, not 10 years, caused huge impacts on, on agriculture in New England, in Europe, and he, he, he showed in China also. And here's a story I can't resist telling. Uh, that summer, uh, Percy Shelley, his soon-to-be wife Mary, and, and Lord Byron went to the shores of Lake Geneva for their summer holidays. But it was so cold and dark and gloomy, they couldn't go hiking or boating. And so they decided to have a contest to see who could write the scariest story. And Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, inspired by the climate effects. Byron didn't write a, a, a story, he wrote a poem called Darkness, which I learned about from Russian scientists when we were doing nuclear winter work in a translation by Turgenev. He, he wrote, I had a dream, which was not all a dream. The bright sun was extinguished and the stars did wander dark, darkly in the eternal space, rayless and pathless. And the icy earth swung blind and blackening in the moonless air. And morn came and went and came and brought no day. And men forgot their passions and the dread of this their desolation. And all hearts were chilled into a selfish prayer for light. It wasn't really that cold, it was about one degree colder, but this is a, a reminded us all of nuclear winter. So a nuclear war between any nuclear states using less than 3% of the current nuclear arsenal would produce climate change unprecedented in human history. Such a so-called small nuclear war could produce global starvation with massive increases ultraviolet radiation, and the current arsenal can still produce nuclear winter killing most of humanity. So how do you feel? <laughs> it's kind of a bummer. I took this picture of Bob Dylan uh, uh, before they came and yelled at me and said, uh, get rid of your camera. So I'm sorry, it's really been a bummer. It's not nice of me to present you with such a depressing story. What do you do with this information? The natural human instinct is to pretend you didn't hear it. As Mark Twain said, denial in just a river in Egypt. So, okay, if that's, if that's what you want to do, but my reaction was to try and do something about it, like Sherry Rowland did. So I want to prevent this from happening. So there have been other attempts. So first of all, there's a, it's a history of treaties to limit the testing of nuclear weapons. The partial test ban treaty prohibited all testing of weapons except underground. The Threshold Test Ban Treaty, the Peaceful Nuclear Explosions Treaty, and then the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which prevents any testing. It hasn't been ratified, the US hasn't ratified it, but Russia has not tested a nuclear weapon since 1990, and the US has not tested a nuclear weapon since 1992 for almost 30 years. Then there are treaties to limit the number of nuclear weapons. The Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was signed by the five countries that had nuclear weapons, it just happened to, first five countries, just happened to be the permanent members of the UN Security Council. But Article 6 commits them to a treaty on general and complete disarmament uh, very quickly, and they've been ignoring that. It, that it mainly uh, helps prevent nuclear proliferation. Then there's the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, but the last one was a new START treaty, which only addresses the US and Russia and only talks about strategic weapons. 
It was signed by Obama and Medvedev in 2010, and it required that each country have a maximum of 1,550 nuclear weapons per side, but they counted each bomber as one warhead because you can't see inside a bomber. So maybe each country has 2,000 nuclear weapons. And it was a 10-year treaty and it was enforced rigorously. They had on-site inspections and it had a provision that either, if they both agreed, they could extend it for five years without any more negotiation or ratification. And President Trump, Putin said, yes, let's do it. President Trump said, no, let's bring China into it. He didn't do it. So we sort of lobbied to get it signed. And as soon as, uh, as Biden became president, the next week he extended the treaty for another five years. So that treaty is in existence. But it turns out you can still produce nuclear winter with, so it doesn't solve the problem. Now there are places in the world where they've banned nuclear weapons. This map shows everything in blue has no nuclear weapons. There are no nuclear weapons in the Southern hemisphere. There's only one country in the Western hemisphere, the US that has nuclear weapons. There's two in Europe, Britain and France. There's six in Asia. The yellow countries are ones that don't have weapons, but they are part of a treaty. Like for example, members of NATO, there are nuclear weapons stationed in these orange countries, Turkey, Italy, Belgium, and, and Germany. So they, uh, and others have treaties like Japan has a treaty with the US. And so uh, hard to believe, but they still think of nuclear weapons as defending them. But these are all the treaties that resulted in that, the Antarctic Treaty, the Latin American Treaty, Outer Space Treaty. And there was a treaty public, uh, that took, was signed uh, four years ago on absolutely prohibiting nuclear weapons, the, the, the ban treaty. And uh, so Brian Tuner and I wrote an article, Self-Assured Destruction. People think of nuclear weapons, we want to keep them for deterrence, mutual assured destruction. If you attack me, I'm gonna attack you, we're all gonna die. But we pointed out it's self-assured destruction. If we use our weapons against Russia and they don't do anything, we're all gonna die from the climate effects. So it's like being a, uh, a mad bomber, a suicide bomber. It makes no sense at all. In fact, deterrence doesn't make any sense. Deterrence doesn't work against terrorism. It doesn't work against cyber warfare. It doesn't, work against, uh, against weapons, conventional weapons. So here's a number of examples of nuclear nations being attacked or being uh, the Soviet take over Eastern Europe. US had nuclear weapons just before Russia had them. The Yom Kippur War, Israel was attacked by Egypt and Syria. The Malvinas or the Falkland Islands War, the UK was attacked by Argentina. Afghanistan, who won the wars in Afghanistan? <laughs> so uh, nuclear Russia, nuclear the US, who won the war in Vietnam? Oh, but we're going, to attack, we're going to use them for deterrence against nuclear nations. Well, there hasn't been a war between new nuclear nations, but why? Was it deterrence or was it something else? There's been a general decline in violence. There's been a growth in international commerce. There's been increase in number of democracies. Uh, uh, other uh, NATO, uh, the EU. So we don't know, but... The, if deterrence is going to work, it has to work perfectly and it has to work forever. And there have been many examples where we almost had a nuclear war. The worst was the Cuban Missile Crisis. I took this picture of a museum in Cuba of the Russian rockets. There were 36 of them there. Each one had a megaton, so 77 times the size of the Hiroshima weapon. There were three regiments with 36 operational nuclear rockets. And it turns out there were tactical nuclear weapons there too. And on October 27th, 1962, uh, which was the, the scariest day, Black Saturday, uh, there were cruise missiles pointed at the US. There was uh, uh, a US spy plane entered Soviet airspace. A US spy plane was shot down over Cuba and a, a Soviet submarine almost launched a nuclear torpedo, but Vasily Arkhipov stopped them from launching it. So we almost had a nuclear war. I had the very surreal experience of being invited to Cuba by Fidel Castro. I met him twice and he sat there across the table uh, and told me uh, that over three hours, how Russia uh, 
a ship showed up every day to support the Cuban revolution. So when they asked to put nuclear weapons there, what could I say? This is a, a cool room uh, baseball cap that I brought as a present for him. Now, Martin uh, Sherwin wrote this great book called Gambling with Armageddon about what happened. And he has some quotes from President Kennedy who gave a uh, told Russia, if you don't, we're going to have a blockade and you have to remove your weapons. And 60 years ago, he said, the world really is impossible to manage so long as we have nuclear weapons. It's really a terrible way to have to live in the world. He also said, every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sort of Damocles hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or madness. Weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. And Sherwin wrote, the real lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the lesson that's consistently resisted, by the way, Martin Sherwin died about a week ago, unfortunately, he was uh, 85. The, the, the lesson that is consistently resisted because it marginalizes the value of nuclear weapons is that nuclear armaments create the perils they are deployed to prevent, but of little use in resolving them. Nuclear weapons create the perils they're deployed to present, but are of little use in resolving them. Avoiding a nuclear war depends on the judgment of national leaders who control nuclear arsenals, which is to say, it's contingent on the world's dwindling reservoir of good luck. I think it's really, we're really lucky that for the past 76 years, there hasn't been a second nuclear war. So what can we do to prevent it? Well, the US has these land-based missiles in the Western United States. They're like a use them or lose them. If they're attacked, the Russians know where they are. They're set to, to, be, to be launched before they're attacked. But what if they're being attacked? That means they didn't work as deterrents. What's the point of launching them? And what if, they, what if it's a mistake that we're being attacked? We also have a sole presidential authority to launch nuclear weapons. The president has a suitcase with the codes and only, only he can launch them. President Truman was so shocked by the use of the two nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he told the military, from now on, you cannot use them unless you talk to me, the president. And this has persisted until then. But why do we have to launch them immediately? Why don't we have a committee if we're ever gonna use them? We have invulnerable uh, nuclear submarines, so we don't have to launch them immediately. Uh, we could change our nuclear apostle policy to one of no first use. We say we have all options are on the table. We don't have, need to have all options on the table. We only, we can say we're only going to use them if we're attacked. And we really should get rid of our land-based missiles. We don't, if we're going to use nuclear weapons, we have uh, them on airplanes, we have them on submarines. Why do we even need them on, on land-based? That makes it much more, much more scary. So I've, been campaigning for this. I went to the second conference on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. There were three of them. I went to two of them. And this led to the passing of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, the first negotiations at the UN. And it, the, the treaty was reached uh, in 2017. And after 50 countries ratified it, earlier this year on January 22nd, the treaty came into, into force. And Unfortunately, the nine countries with nuclear weapons are trying to ignore the will of the rest of the world that we get rid of nuclear weapons. There's gonna be a, a, treat, uh, a meeting in March next year on uh, the first meeting of the state parties of all the countries and Norway's announced that they're going to attend, they're interested. So peace prizes have been given for people advocating nuclear disarmament. Uh, Linus Pauling, Noah Philip, Noah Baker, uh, the IPPNW and in 2017, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, got a Nobel Peace Prize for its work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian impacts of nuclear war, which is partly our work, and because they got the ban treaty passed. And I really like the, their logo. Uh, and uh, Beatrice Finn, who's the uh, director of ICANN, when she accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, said, the story of nuclear weapons will have an ending. It's up to us what that ending will be. Will it be the end of nuclear weapons or will, will it be the end of us? Only one of, these, one of these things will happen. The only rational course of action is to cease living under the conditions where our mutual destruction is only one impulsive tantrum away. And when she gave, the, gave this talk, uh, Kim and, and, and uh, Trump were arguing about whose button was bigger. So it was pretty scary. So nuclear weapons can be used if they exist. 
A nuclear war could start tomorrow by accident, hackers, computer failure, bad sensors, or unstable leaders. Nuclear arsenals do not deter attacks from non-nuclear states, terrorists, or pandemics. The only way deterrence would work between nuclear states is if states believe other states are willing to kill themselves by using their nuclear weapons and if there's a guarantee that there will be no unintended use. The only way really to prevent a global catastrophe is to get rid of nuclear weapons. So I joined the Physicist Coalition for Nuclear Threat Reduction, which was started about a year ago by the American Physical Society, and it's funded by the Carnegie Corporation and APS, and we have a full-time staffer in APS headquarters. And here's the 13 of us who are members of the team and we've been going around to physics departments around the country. We we're going to do it in person, but we did it with Zoom to give talks about each of us works on a different part of the issue and ask people to join. And we have 540 members of, of the uh, Physicist Coalition now. And what we do is we work for advocacy. So it's actually lobbying. It's sending letters to members of Congress. We targeted which physics departments we would go to because they would be in states which had members of Congress who were on arms control or, mil or, or military committees, foreign affairs committees, so they could actually be uh, forceful in Congress. And we advocated in 2020 for a no resumption of nuclear testing, as some people were advocating, or to, and to extend the New START Treaty for five more years, both of which happened. Right now we're uh, advocating adopting a no first use policy. And we're discussing uh, whether to also eliminate launch on warning, eliminate land-based ICBMs and eliminate presidential civil authority. So if you wanna be part of this, you can just scan this barcode or go to this website, physicistcoalition.org. And if you, if you join, every once in a while, you'll get an email that says, would you wanna sign on this letter to your member of Congress? We also support uh, some physics postdocs and who are interested in, in uh, uh, getting rid of nuclear threat. And so you can be part of, and, and also uh, they organize meetings with members of Congress, either in their district office or in Washington to lobby for these things. And so uh, I'm giving a talk, uh, uh, I, I gave a talk at the, at, at the University of Tennessee and a number of other, and, and the, uh, Oak Ridge, and we've also given talks at, at weapons labs. There are physicists from Oak Ridge National Lab, and they invited me to come back and give a talk to them. And so we're trying to make people aware of the dangers of nuclear weapons. So just I'll end, uh, Carl Sagan was one of the authors of the TAPS paper on uh, the first American paper on this. And people said, Carl, are you sure you want to get rid of nuclear weapons? He said, for myself, I would far rather have a world in which the climatic catastrophe cannot happen, independent of the vicissitudes of leaders, institution, and machines. This seems to me elementary planetary hygiene, as well as elementary patriotism. So I agree. I think elementary planetary hygiene demands that we eliminate nuclear weapons faster than the current pace. And so I hope we learn from this and our planet ends up looking beautiful like this for a long time to come. If you want more information, you can go to my website. Thanks very much. Uh, well, thank you very much, Alan. Um, if you have a question for Alan, I, I have one myself, but if you have a question for Alan um, and would like to type it in the chat, we will make sure that, that he gets it uh, right now. Um, my, my question is sort of one of, it's a more of a, a geopolitical question than anything else, which is, you know, we have, we have the, the Paris Climate Accord, and it seems to me that, that this is somewhat of a climate issue. Uh, uh, and, I, and I wondered if there had ever been any, uh, any thought that maybe that, that this might be a forum where this discussion could take place as well. So I, you did mention, uh, I was a lead author of the uh, IPC, the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The, the sixth report just came out, so I was a lead author of the fifth one. Now I was on a chapter on radiative forcing of climate, which included how volcanic eruptions cause climate to change. And I helped write that part of the chapter. And I put a, uh, a paragraph in there that said volcanic eruptions, their impacts on climate can be used as an analog for climatic effects of nuclear war. And then the chapter was sent out for review all around the world and, and people that wanted to could write comments and we had to respond to everyone. And some people said that doesn't belong in this report. This is about, this is not a political issue. This belongs in, 
in, this is only about global warming and uh, other people said, that's very important. You should really highlight that. So it was kind of controversial. And at our third authors meeting, the Tom Stocker, who was the head of the whole working group one came to our, our chapter meeting and said, Alan, you really ought to take that out. And I said, but Tom, the scoping document, which says when uh, what we should write about said this chapter should write about the effects of fires on climate. And he said, well, we meant forest fires. I said, well, it doesn't say that, it just says the effects of fires. I said, Tom, you said we should look at the most important journal, climate, uh, journals and be sure to capture what's in them and assess their reports. And there's been a paper in science, papers in nature, papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on this topic. And uh, your government, Switzerland, actually funded our work and so I think it should really, uh, and it does cause climate change. I think it should stay in here. And uh, Keith Schein, who is one of the uh, review editors said, you know, I've been think lock thinking about this and uh, I first thought it shouldn't be in there, but after listening to the discussion, I think maybe it should be in there. And Tom Stocker looked at me and said, okay, I've changed my mind, leave it in. <laughs> which was really amazing because usually people make up their mind and never change their mind. So there's actually a box in the fifth IPCC report that sort of highlights this result. So it's in the IPCC report. And so I would, that's why I talk about it's, it would be instant climate change. And I say, we really have to solve this problem. So we have the luxury of worming, worrying about global warming. Uh, thank you very much. Now there, uh... Obviously, in this format, we probably don't have as much dialogue as, as a normal seminar, but, uh, but there are a couple of thank yous very much for your presentation in the, in the, uh, in the chat area right now. And I'd like to also be the person that, uh, that thanks you. Are there any uh, other questions here? Um, speak now or forever hold your chat, I guess. I looked at the uh, chat, but I didn't see any. I didn't see any. Yeah, I think there it's it's a little bit more difficult to have a dialogue in this format. But it was a very in, informative presentation, and I enjoyed it, and I hope that uh, everyone else did as well. Uh, and thank you very much for all of your efforts here, uh, and and uh, hopefully uh, this will this will gain some momentum. Uh, hopefully it will. You know, and I, I'm really thankful that Rutgers supports what I do. When I first got invited to go to Cuba. I went there. I didn't know I was going to meet Fidel, and I did, and gave a talk. And he sat there in the audience and listened for an hour. And I talked to him. And I came back. And uh, our seminars are on Friday, and we didn't have anybody. I, I went down on Monday, on Tuesday, came back on Thursday, and there was nobody in the seminar slot. So I said, "Can I give a seminar on Friday about a seminar that I gave?" <laughs> and so. It was advertised, it was, the room was packed. Remember having seminars in rooms? And uh, Bob Goodman, the Dean came and I thought, hmm, wait a minute. One of our senators, Menendez is a Cuban refugee and he's really anti-Castro. If I do this, is it going to uh, affect uh, the uh, uh, records? Is it gonna look bad to records? So I wrote a, 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 uh, an email to the president of records Dear Dick, uh, uh, is, I'm going to give a seminar. Do you want me? But do you want me not to do it? And by the time it was time for the seminar, I didn't get a response. So I gave the seminar, and two weeks later, I I I uh, I got a uh, email from him, and I was a little afraid to open it, but I opened it, and he said, "Dear Alan, sounds like a really interesting experience. Congratulations." So, and then I got, like you mentioned, I got this award for global impact. So uh, last year from Rutgers. So I'm really happy that I'm in an institution that, uh, that supports that I try and take action to, to warn the world about dangers that I discover in my research. Well, we actually got a late uh, question here. Thank, and, and, and it was about, uh, and, and here's the question, um, basically, Okay, I, I can see the question uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, from Casey Shaw. Uh, yeah. I was wondering where North Korea stands in all this with the lack of global cooperation. Well, I don't think, <laughs> I certainly don't know <laughs> what North Korea thinks. Uh, the problem, North Korea got nuclear weapons because uh, a, a Pakistani uh, general sold the 
nuclear technology to them in exchange for help with missiles. So that's part of nuclear proliferation. And they were worried, they thought that it would help them from being overrun by uh, South Korea. So they had devoted a tremendous amount of their resources to, uh, to their nuclear arsenal. I think that in order to, I mean, why should nuclear, why should North Korea listen to us? Why should Iran listen to us? We tell Iran, we don't want you to have nuclear weapons. Why should they listen to us? It's like we're sitting in a bar, having a beer, telling people not to drink. Why, if we keep our weapons, why, what right do we have to tell anybody not to have nuclear weapons? Doesn't that set the example that everybody in the world should have nuclear weapons? So I think the way to, the way to proceed is to get rid of our nuclear weapons, to set an example. There's all these countries in the world have chosen not to have nuclear weapons, and they think it's better off not to have them. South Africa actually developed nuclear weapons with help from Israel. They actually tested one in the atmosphere, and then they decided we don't want to have them, and they dismantled their program. Brazil and Argentina both started nuclear weapons uh, research programs, but they decided not to have them. So I think we have to set an example. We can't use them. If we use them, we'll kill ourselves. So they don't deter uh, anybody. So I think we should set an example by getting rid of them. When the Soviet Union was falling apart, President George H.W. Bush decided to reduce our nuclear arsenal unilaterally without a treaty with Russia. And later, the Soviet Union followed suit. So I, I, I tried to uh, write to President Obama and to President Trump and say, look, why don't you set an example by reducing our arsenal? Uh, we have many more than we need. Set an example. But they wouldn't. the, the pressures from the uh, military industrial complex, from companies that are making all this money, and now in order for the U.S. to, to sign the Senate to ratify the New START Treaty, they got Obama to agree to modernize our nuclear arsenal. So now the U.S. is committed to spend a trillion dollars or more over the next decade to replace all of our, all of our weapons with moder so-called modern ones and waste all these resources when we could use them to, uh, to I mean, you, there are websites we can see what you could do with a trillion dollars in terms of uh, free medical care for everybody or or uh, all, all the things that they're trying to do in, in some of these bills now. And so uh, yet the military industrial co complex that President Eisenhower warned us about is in charge. So we really have to, if I was president, I'd start reducing our nuclear arsenal. And the uh, US military is having a, a policy review right now on our nuclear, it's called the Nuclear Threat Initiative. And or no, no they're, uh, they're new. I forget what it's called. Anyway, they're reviewing our nuclear policy right now. They're having a, a try to decide what our policy should be. And Biden had the, uh, had the guts to uh, take our soldiers out of Afghanistan. And uh, I don't know what he's going to do. Uh, the current budget continues this modernization, but, but it's up to the president to decide. So I think the answer is to... Uh, show North Korea that nuclear weapons aren't important and uh, take them out of South Korea, for example, because that's threatening them. And uh, anyway, that's, that's my view. But I, you know, I'm an expert on climate change. I'm not an expert on po policy, but I feel like uh, Naomi Oreskes is a professor at Harvard. She was in, at San Diego and she wrote op-eds in the New York Times saying, scientists err on the side of caution. We're very cautious, we're always, Look, like to look at uncertainties, but scientists know more than anybody else about things like global warming and, and by implication, nuclear winter. And so uh, I think we have to, uh, when we find a danger, warn people about it because we're experts on it. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to do. Well, I thank you very much. Um, again, uh, terrific uh, seminar. And I, I think we, uh, uh, I don't see any additional questions in the in the chat, so I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Alan for a very nice presentation and definitely some very thought provoking uh, stuff for all of us uh, to think about. Um, and I guess at this point, um, I will uh, end the seminar.
uh, and thank all the participants for their time and, and hope everyone has a, a really, really good weekend. And okay, and I hope Ben's, uh, Ben's students were watching because I did this because he wanted a seminar for his seminar students to, to look at. So Some of them are responding. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, bye-bye.